What's up guys and gals, welcome back to the Nerd Castle where you and I have some shopping to do. This is actually one of the most fun things about Shadowrun. One of the things that defines Shadowrun to me as a tabletop game are the late night gearing sessions before you go on a run where you sit there and you're doing leg work and you're doing a whole bunch of other stuff. You're sitting down with your shopping list and you're buying all the cool gear. It's like that moment, you know when you're watching an old sci-fi movie or like a James Bond movie or whatever. Before they go on the mission there's always that cool period where they're like, Napalm and they're like adding new stuff onto their bullet vests and whatnot and they're like putting things in their pockets And they're talking about all the cool equipment they have That's one of the best things about Shadowrun in my opinion is that you get to do that before every single mission Until you have a lot of good stuff anyways And in today's episode we get to do that So I wanted to spend a bunch of money I can have three programs one ESP I've got 175 IP IP is my HP by the way part of me thinks that I should probably Oh, you get five seconds. Okay. Cool. An extra five seconds when hacking blocker IC. That's pretty badass. Considering how close I was to losing in that last one. That's not a bad call, but we need new programs. We need suppression for sure. We need... I would take Killer 1.0. Killer 1.0 is an attack on one cooldown, essentially. You can use it every single turn. It does 75 damage to one target once you're inside of the Matrix. Considering we have another attack right now that has a cooldown as well, we need something we can like rotate in between or at least use as filler. We can also do Shield 1.0. I don't know if that sounds good. We could reduce their AP. That sounds pretty good too. We'd use Sniffer. But I think for right now, I'm pretty happy with like just these. I don't want to spend too much money on any one acquisition right now. Because that's kind of a rough thing. The boost persona speed would be nice too. So I'll take that. I mean, I would love to jump into a Renraku Craftwork right now. But I'm just going to wait on it. So let me go ahead and confirm that real fast. I think that if we were going to put it on our deck, we have to do that later, as I recall. It doesn't go into here, although this is a little bit different from how it worked in the previous game. But I figure we'll be all right. Boom! Another, <laughs> Boom, another problem solved by Law's Technology Palace. All right, I'll see you later, Law. Yeah, whatever. He's, he's mercurial. What can you do about it? We need to find anybody that got gats, guns, and otherwise explodey bits. I have enough money left over where I can equip some of my other Shadowrunners if I want to. Or, worst case scenario, I can get myself strapped in with some new gear. What's in the Club 88? Can I go in now that I'm hooked up with the triads? Like most troll bouncers, this man is knotted with muscles. But absent of the myriad scars that come with age or indiscretion, his only blemishes are the bony skin growths common to his kind and a single deep scar across his neck and collarbone. You watch yourself in there, else we check your aerodynamics. Aerodynamics? Anyone causes trouble, I see how far I can throw him. No fighting, no killing, no sex trade. He lifts an arm, flexing. His muscles pump out like a mass of serpents and steel cabling. His arm is easily as thick as most humans' waists. I don't mess around. Yeah, most bouncers I know don't mess around. Bouncers, you gotta think about it like this. Like, I had a friend who was a bouncer for a long time. Kind of a useful guy in a scrap. And essentially, when you're a bouncer, your job is to, like, kick people's asses all day, every day. And essentially, you can't get around it. I mean, people are going to try and pick fights with you simply based on the fact that you're a bouncer and they're a drunk asshole. And so they're just going to try and test you. And so essentially, you are going to have to, like, dictate your territory when you're a bouncer. You really have no choice in the whole thing. Yeah, I got a couple friends that bounced for a while in this local area. And it's it seems like a job that's, like, stressful. But at the same time, eh, you know, if you want to learn how to kick ass and you got, like, judo skills and you want to practice them and things like that what better way to do it legally what do you do spider shin spider shin spider shin climbs a wall and touches men despite the wind and rain pelting hioi the proprietor of the stall a monk judging by their outfit is unconcerned the monk's expression is different though hardly placid or serene muscles show as tightly wound metal bands beneath the skin ready to snap in any direction without a warning What's more, the monk's robes are anything but ordinary. Certainly, silk makes up the base outfit, but it's paired with high-impact ballistic armor, heavy-duty boots, and a bandolier of throwing knives. The table in front of you is arrayed with a wide variety of melee weapons, charms, jade pendants, and other mystical accoutrements. Beneath an awning in the rear are rows upon rows of cages, each housing some variety of exotic reptile or insect. These, in turn, are flanked by jars and boxes of Chinese herbs, incense, powders, and inks. The monk spares you only the shortest of glances as you approach. I am Monk Shen. Most people in Hiyoi call me Spider Shin on account of the spiders back there. You're not local, not by a long shot. What tipped you off? He, smeeks, or he smirks crookedly, two teeth poking out from between his thin lips. Body language. 
You're not afraid to look me in the eye, for one. For another, your clothes. Not in fashion, here in Hong Kong. Swords, knives, clubs, I sell it all. I make most of these, but if I can't, I've got friends who can. If you need incense or salves or meditation, or salves for meditation, I make and sell those, too. If your joints ache, I can give you acupuncture. Shen places both palms on the table, leaning over it with a wicked grin. So what can I show you? You're a monk and a weapons dealer? That's pretty badass, though. I like it. Let's see what he's got in terms of guns and things like that. Or is he simply... Ah, oh, never mind. I got excited for nothing. This guy is actually only for adepts, so he's not really going to help us that much. You sell the snakes and spiders, too? No. They're mine. I can sell you the things I craft with my hands and the things I can do. But the medicines and poisons I make are my secret. If you want those, you apprentice to me. In five years, maybe I show you how to make a poultice, eh? They're that secret? Of course they're secret. That's what sets me apart from the rest of the street dealers in Hiyoi. You want cram or bliss, any two-bit triad punk can make that for you. But I can realign your key, set your yin and yang in balance, or yet, or set someone else's out of balance with a few drops. To master my skill, you need to learn for years. It's not just following a formula. You want to learn, you need patience too. You try to learn without patience and all you do is ape the masters. Shen snaps two fingers and points at the cages. You have to understand them to truly learn my art. Otherwise, you never become a master. You might as well get a skill soft. Okay. I need somebody with guns, though. That's what I'm more interested in. I want somebody with guns. Somebody with the hookup on some DACA here, because I need to shoot somebody. Wasn't there, like, a dwarf around here somewhere that did that? I remember there's a guy standing around somewhere, like, on one of these little side barges that was offering guns, but I'm not completely sure where he went. He was, like, one of these little dudes over here, but... Hmm... The cyber dock was over here inside of one of these buildings, if I remember right. And the guy I want has got to be around. Maybe that's him right there. I bet it is. His name's Jin. That's a bit... Ooh, reliable Matthew. Smooth jazz drifts from cheap speakers on the barge. A wide array of worn-down drones litter the battered deck. Most are utility and domestic types, but a few, cordoned off from the others, are low-end security models. The salesman smiles indulgently at you. A tall, lanky human of clear Cantonese ancestry is wearing a cheap suit and limply clutching a smelly cigarillo. He adjusts his tie with an exaggerated nonchalance, languid, ost ostentatious, like an American casino promoter. Hey there, beautiful. Welcome to our floating heaven. You got a discerning look to you. What brings you to reliable Matthew's robot bazaar? Oh, that'd be good. He taps Ash over a bulky cleaning drum beside him. Not waiting for an answer, he continues. Perhaps you're looking for a hexacopter as a guide to Hong Kong, or a little handheld tarantula beauty to brew your tea. I'm interested in your combat models. Reliable Matthew looks over his shoulder at the security drone, some heavily cannibalized in the corner of the yard. He turns back to you with a nervous smile. Funny you should ask. I just got a Doberman that I'm selling at an incredible bargain price. Should we take a look? Yeah, let's look at the security drones. Oh, damn. These look a little bit different. Oh, they're expensive. Damn, son. You also need repair kits. I think you can't repair drones otherwise. You have to have these little repair kit thingies to make it work. So what do we have here? We have a Mark II Doberman, a basic combat drone that every rigger should own at least once in their shadow career. We've got a Doberman Mark II Assault, the assault variant of the classic Doberman drone. Its turret has been modified with a burst fire for short-range skirmishes. Can you see what stats it has? Like, can you investigate the drone further? A smoker, a support drone that's equipped to lay a smoke trail anywhere that you need it most. Okay, we might run the either the drug mule or the robo dock at some point, but for right now I think this will work, although the sniper would be great too. Well, I'm a rigger, and so far none of those points are being properly utilized, so let's take the Mark II Assault, I guess. And so there it is, it actually slotted it in for us without us having to do it. Awesome! That leaves us with, like, no cash left. We went through 2,000 New Yen way faster than I care to admit, but at the bare minimum, we at least have the stuff we need right now in order to get into the shadows while reasonably equipped. You never want to go out. Normally what happens in Shadowrun is when you start the game out, you buy your gear with leftover stat points. At least that's how it used to work. You had stat points that you could spend on karma or whatever else, and then you could also spend it on gear. Let's spend some of our karma real quick. Karma, 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 chameleon. Okay, so we got six intelligence. That's pretty good. Five is considered good intelligence. One is considered like, eh, he's kind of dumb. 
Nine would be considered like Einstein level genius. So, you know, in case you wanted to write some Feynman lectures or something. I think we'll probably go after we have Drone Control 3. I don't know exactly how you tell what class the drones are, but I don't know. We could take plus one dodge right there, and then we could take... I have eight available. Okay, just so I know what I'm playing with here. Or we could go deeper into decking and get better at that. And that would get us into Fuchi Virtua X. But we haven't even bought the craft work yet, so... That would be leapfrogging several generations of cyber deck. I would say... Oh, really? I can equip two drones if I go in right there? Damn, son. That sounds amazing. Let's do that one. That sounds awesome. And then from here... Can I skip these? No, I was going to say. I thought that you probably wouldn't be able to. Let's take drone control up to four. And we'll also take... With my quickness stat, how am I looking as far as my firearms go? Because I'd still like to be useful in a scrap. Like, I don't want to rely entirely on my drones the entire game. Used to calculate your chance to hit or miss. Reduces the chance to be hit by enemy attacks. So that gives me Overwatch as well. That'd be useful to have. I think I just got to decide on something to focus on for right now. Let's stick with... Let's maybe go in on... It's either going to be decking or it's going to be drone combat. I'm going to go with drone combat, I guess, for right now. And then we'll confirm that right there. Now that I can equip two drones, should I just go buy another one? I know I can't afford them, but still. It'd be super sick if I could. Nope, looks like I can't. I don't have any cyberware either, aside from my data jack, which came for freebies. We go up to the cyber jock... Oh, we could go to the cyber dock and not the cyber jock. The cyber jock really, really, really likes online fantasy football. But anyways, was Jin the dwarf... Hmm, ah, you got me there, Jin. He laughs, a pleasant full sound. As it trails off, he spots you watching the game. A broad smile brightens his cheeks. Why, hello there, young man. Something you need? The long-faced man gives a cursory look and continues to collect black stones. Just a gawker, Shayu. It's your turn. Or Shiyu. I don't know if you say Shayu or Shiyu. I'm sure it's probably like Shiyu. The name's Splattercat. Got a second for a question? Shiyu nods. I could use a short break. How about you, Chin? Jin sighs. Shoulders slumping forward after a moment of scowling, he reluctantly speaks. Fine. A short break. The two elders turn towards the younger man. He looks to be in his early thirties, but it's difficult to tell. The skin on his face is smooth and supple, with only the suggestion of creases at the eye, mouth, and forehead. But small gestures, a blink, a flare of his nostrils briefly reveal the lines of his face. The man's eyes raise from the go-board and study the elders, and he nods. Been having any strange dreams lately? I hear that happens around here. The three men exchange looks. Shiyu turns to you. What a coincidence. Was it but an hour ago that we were all discussing that very thing? We have been having very bad dreams. Every one of us. I had them myself. We should compare notes. What did you dream about? Is that right? Jin leans in, stares at you. Can't say I'm comfortable giving a stranger details about my dream. Shiyu waves his hand dismissively at Jin. Don't mind him. He's always been a poor sport. But he raises a good point. Some of our dreams contain information best left private. Just as yours do, I'm sure. Having just met, how can we be sure that you'll respect our personal information? I'll tell you. The younger man's voice cuts through the din like a razor where the elders fall silent. He turns to you and he locks his eyes, dark orbs that burn with piercing scrutiny into yours. He nods and returns his gaze to the go-board. I believe you're trustworthy. Please, Splattercat, make yourself comfortable and I'll share my dream with you. I'm listening. Well, let's go. Let's be appreciative. I appreciate it. Go ahead. He exhales slowly, then begins speaking. I dreamed of a long, dingy hall. When faced with such a thing, one generally walks its length, so I lifted my right foot and placed it in front of me. But upon taking that first step, I found myself instead drawn down an alleyway to my left. It wasn't there before, this alley. It appeared only as he began to walk. As I moved down the alley, I found myself surrounded by friends and loved ones. They all stood there, silently watching me with smiles on their faces. As I passed each one of them, they fell to the ground in my wake, dropping like puppets with severed strings. Somehow I knew that if I followed this road to the end, I could have everything I'd ever dreamed of. But I woke before I could reach it. He folds his hands across his lap. There's a moment of silence before she you speaks up, the rosiness in his cheeks having drained away. I too saw the long hall. My own experience was different, however. The hall was far off in the distance, and I was looking down on it from a strange angle, as though I were perched on a wall high above. He pauses and looks at you. You know, young man, 
Splattercat, you look very much like the person I saw walking that hall. He moved steadily down the path, walking at an even pace, and just behind him a great and terrible shadow followed. Of course, I didn't have the best view up there on the wall or wherever I was. It could have been anyone. Perhaps his old mind, or perhaps this old mind of mine is seeing your face now and misremembering the dream. He lets out a chuckle and a small flush of red returns to his cheeks. He looks over at Jin. All right, Jin. Go ahead. Jin broods in his corner, arms crossed, and jaw set. I've changed my mind. I don't want to share my dream. Nonsense! Master Lao and I have both told him our dreams, and now it's your turn. Jin sticks out his lower lip. No. It's fine. You don't have to tell me if you don't want to. He holds his palm towards you and looks at Shiyu. See? Straight from the horse's mouth. I don't have to. Jin. Lao's voice is firm but soft. This is important. Jin's mouth opens and closes like a gasping fish, but as he looks at Lao, his body relaxes and a sadness seems to take hold of his features. All right, all right. But don't you go repeating any of this, you hear me? He takes in a deep breath and slowly releases it. Folds his hands in his lap. My dream began as a nightmare. I dreamed of the failures and mistakes that I've made throughout my life. The people I've let down, the competitors I've crushed, the wife who died in hospice without me. I dreamed of the family that I abandoned. A change comes over him, his eyes brighten, and he continues energetically. But then, then I dreamed of the wall city. I stood before it, and its door opened to me. And when I passed inside, all of my guilt fell away. It was as though the city had absolved me. It washed me away my guilt. And I remember feeling happy. As his remembrance ends, so does his lightened mood. His face shrinks into a pout, and he stares grumpily at the ground. There. I did it. You happy? Lao nods slowly. Thank you, Jin. You have my thanks as well. Yeah, yeah, now can we change the subject? My ulcer's acting up. I'm guessing you've been around these parts longer than I have. Is this sort of thing normal? If it were normal, we wouldn't be huddled around discussing them in whispers, now would we? Enough of that, Jin. Splattercat here asked in earnest for our advice, and he deserves a proper response. Shiyu gives you a gentle smile. Please forgive our friend. Bitter years have left him suspicious of others. The answer to your question is no. Upsetting dreams have never been uncommon in Hioi, but those recent visitations have been different. They've been darker, more vivid, stronger than normal dreams. Last night, I felt consumed by the sense that something was coming. While my friends here felt a sense of relief and excitement as their dreams ended, I felt as though I were sitting on the precipice of some vast and terrible chasm, chasm, with the void yawning beneath my feet. I don't know why I said chasm right there. Suddenly, his cheeks flush, he blinks twice and then looks away. But perhaps these are just the ramblings of an old man. Please forgive me. He scratches his nose, embarrassed. You speak wisely, Shiyu. It is foolish to embrace a thing that you do not understand. What Jin and I saw in our dreams was alluring, but so was the light to a moth. Your instincts are still strong and sharp, my old friend. It is wise of you to trust them. Shiyu bows deeply, his eyes to the ground. Thank you. I can only hope these dreams do lead to something beautiful. There's already enough deception in this world. Can we get back to the game now? I've got to head out as well. Of course. Take care, Splattercat, and if you find some time on your hands, you're always welcome at our game table. Thanks. Good luck with your game. Appreciated, young man. We'll be seeing you. Alright, well, that conversation was not the arms deal that I thought it was going to be. Let's go ahead and actually, I've almost spent an entire episode just wandering around town fiddling with stuff. I figure at some point we should probably get to our next job, right? I mean, we're more or less out of money right now. Maso Menos, we sort of broke, G, so I figure we should probably earn some cash and we'll come back later. I doubt we're going to be able to buy anything anyways with the money we have on hand. 500, oh, look at my little drone. He flies around behind me. Yay! My consistent love of weaponized Roombas continues long, long into the future. Should I go down here? Ractor. It's oppressively hot down here, and the air is full of synthetic odors that grab you by the sinuses and refuse to let go. You can smell engine grease and melting plastic, ionized air, and lead solder. A quick scan of the room tells you why. The downstairs tenant has converted the place into a machine shop. Metal fabrication tools and duraplast extruders line the walls, and a pair of heavy industrial manipulators hang from the ceiling. A man in a black trench coat stands with his back to you, staring at a monitor mounted above a sturdy workbench. He addresses you without turning. Ah, I was wondering when I'd get to meet the new neighbor. 
His voice is pleasant, cultured. There's a hint of a Russian accent there, but it's buried under layers of nuance. Please, stay where you are. I'll be with you in just a moment, and unless you fancy an unplanned trip to Chrome Alley, don't touch anything. There are all manner of tools in here that could take your hand clean off. Thanks for the warning. Don't mention it. I have no interest in seeing anyone hurt in my shop, especially not my upstairs neighbor. I guess we'll examine the robotic arms mounted to the ceiling. You focus on the enormous manipulator arms that you saw earlier. They're bulky, industrial things dented from years of heavy use. Each arm has been fitted with at least a dozen different welders, soldering guns, extruders, and metal fabrication tools. You've seen machinery like this in factories before, but they look terribly out of place in the bolt holes cramped engine room. Very good. Yeah. That's coming along nicely. Very nicely indeed. He turns towards you smiling, and for the first time you can see his face, he has broadly handsome Slavic features and a chiseled jaw. His eyes are like flecks of ice. Sorry to have kept you waiting, Mr... Splattercat, it's no problem. Don't worry about it. You're too kind. Now tell me, what can I do for... His voice trails off as a flash of motion catches his eye. With alarming speed, a sinister-looking drone scuttles out from under the work table. Its movements are surprisingly agile and fluid. The machine rears back menacingly, spreading its forelegs in a clear sign of aggression. The man's smile tilts and his tone goes apologetic. Please, don't, don't mind the drone. He could be territorial. But so long as you remain civil, he won't bite. He extends a hand. Simultaneously, the drone relaxes into a neutral position, lowering its killing legs. Ractor. My mechanical counterpart here is called Kashi. Shake his hand. A pleasure. His hand is rough and abnormally warm to the touch. He shakes your hand with a solid grip. I am very pleased to meet you, my friend. In a community such as Sioi, it's important to be on good terms with one's neighbors. Agreed. Speaking of which, I'd like to ask you a couple questions, if you have time. He glances at the bracer on his forearm. A technical display winks to life, then gutters out. Very well. This morning's casting should still be in cooling for a few minutes yet. That's enough time to talk. This morning's casting? What do you mean? Exactly what I said. A casting that I made out of a new locomotive assembly for Kashi. He gestures at the display above the work table. A biomimetic design, as you can see. This one is inspired by the walking legs of a decapod crustacean, the mangrove crab, to be specific. You're designing drone parts in here? He nods, and fabricating them, yes. How did you learn to do that? More training and experience that I care to mention, he offers you a wry smile. Drone architecture was once my profession, you see. Now it's more of a calling, one that I'm free to pursue now that I've freed myself from the shackles of corporate servitude. Are you Russian? I thought I caught a hint of an accent there. He nods. You have a good ear. I'm impressed. Yeah, I grew up in the... I don't even know how to say that, so I'm just going to butcher it. Yes, I grew up in the Nizhny Novgorod, went to school there. Started my career there in the industrial sector. A fairly common story, I'm sure. I'm sure it's pronounced like Nizhnye, or something like that, but I don't know Russian, as you might have guessed. But I have also traveled a great deal, and in so doing, I have absorbed a number of other languages and dialects. How many do you speak? Counting Russian and Cantonese? Fifteen. He shrugs apologetically. It shames me to admit that I'm only literate in twelve, however. You're either way too hard on yourself or acting ashamed to cover up the fact that you're bragging, yeah. That's still impressive. Perhaps, when compared to the common man, but I've known a great many polyglots who can and do put me to shame. He gives you another half shrug, and Kashi mirrors the gesture. Arabic has been a particular bugbear of mine. The unfamiliar characters and lack of vowels make it damn tricky to get a handle on. But I suppose all men have their limits. Alright, well, I, I think I'm just gonna go. I wanna go look at the mission interface before we get out of here. I know I don't want to spend too much time. What's in this room off on this side? Does something bad happen if I come over here? Huh. Looks like that's his crash pad over there. Alright, let's go back up to the top. Check this on out and see how this has changed since Dragonfall. Your workstation and mission computer. The cool blue tones of the workstation's main menu fill the screen. A blinking message in the upper right corner notifies you that you have six unread messages. Alright, well you know what I might do for this episode? I might upload two this day. I'm going to write it down on my notepad. And I think I'm going to give you guys two episodes the day that this goes up. Because honestly, I actually feel like we didn't get a whole lot done here. And so if I can, I'll probably just put them both up at the same time. And people can filter through them 
as much as they desire to do so, but we're out of time for the day. My name is Splattercat. This is Shadowrun Hong Kong. Make sure to check it out down below in the description if you wanted to pick up the game. I will see you all later. Hi, do everybody.